only means go. Ah, All right. So thank you very much. Thank you to Helen and your entire team, because I know it takes a thousand hands to make anything work. Um, and so I really appreciate being here. I always, um, in my trajectory, in my own journey, every time I come to a completely new audience, I think, why didn't I know about that discipline? Um, and I probably would have been amongst you. So um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And although um, you just heard that I'm a president, which is a university's chief executive officer, responsible for the success of our students, our faculty, our leadership, my own research work actually sits in the domain of design, space, and play. I'm going to present in two arenas, um, one through the lens of my early life. As a child, I was a first-generation latchkey kid in inner-city Montreal, often out in the streets without a designated caregiver. So um, the projects here cultivated an interest for me um, on that level. Two, I'll be describing the experimental work I've done with action artists, including children, that have deep parallels with playful learning landscapes. So here we are at Pratt Institute. I'm very proud to say that Nidhi is actually a faculty member at Pratt Institute. Um, and so the very work that she does in looking at environments is part of our entire curriculum. I'm not actually going to talk about that, although I could spend much of the day on it. So um, I'm uh, from a family of, um, and neighborhood of working class Holocaust survivor immigrants in urban Montreal. I grew up believing I spent all of my time outside in the streets. And of course, it was Canada. And I forgot the seven months of winter, where I played indoors at Neighborhood House a stripped-down set of rooms above a grocery store. And only last year, last year, as I'm kind of going through what was my life like, um, I discovered that the place I hung out was, and I quote, neighborhood house was set up to keep immigrant adolescents off the street, assist their integration into the community, combat a pervasive problem of juvenile delinquency, um, and serve as a social educational, cultural, and recreational center for children in the area. So apparently, problems of delinquency for my group were disproportionate to my community's population, attributed to the substandard parenting of immigrant parents. Neighborhood House provided youth with a refuge to avert antisocial tendencies. It had a lending library, as well as if I could, um, art classes, Membership included multiple first-generation communities. I had no idea it had dedicated caseworkers and staff who invested much time and energy there, recognizing their responsibility for shaping future citizens. What I knew is I went there after school with little obvious supervision. Dance was our common language. We had very limited resources. We depended on each, other's, on each other as friends, supporters, turf warriors, to be brave in the world. Fast forward many, many years. Um, I had graduated from two professional schools. I'm an engineer and an architect. I also did a business degree. Um, I worked in practice, building moderate income housing, women's centers, mixed use urban projects. I taught at night from tech programs with students of all ages, learning how to learn to do construction documents, to teaching design studios at McGill. Indeed, I would spend my future life working across boundaries. I used physical projects to connect action artists, contractors, engineers, architects, musicians, designers. So after grad school in architecture, as a faculty member at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, upstate New York, I was working with architecture students who, although making and building was part of their DNA, they did this at very small scales, different kind of scales than you were talking about a minute ago, and often abstracted. I saw my students didn't actually understand that what they were building in eighth scale drawings, little drawings, um, what it meant to full scale space or even models. So we started to design full scale installations 
in order to extrapolate without drawings and models what it meant when you blew them up to human scale. It's not something we do in architecture schools. We do little models because we don't have the resources to build full scale all the time. Well, something happened along the way. My dance life entered the studio. That's how I connected cultures earlier, so I was very comfortable in that arena. We began designing performance projects wrapped around an abbreviated model of design build. The full-scale project is hands-on. The shift from visual, which is often what we're doing in architecture, to bodily determination, where collaboration creates mutual movement and students and performers refer to each other. Very similar to the community-based work we've been talking about. There is very, very different learning that goes on when it moves from the visual to the visceral, from the drawn to the haptic. When we built these spaces in the school studio, in abandoned stores, in the city, we invited action artists to occupy them. This included anyone from skateboarders to rogue running children. Rogue running children. That's I think what I was called. Rogue running child. The dancers and the athletes began to explore the potentials of space, seeing how we engaged with each other and the space itself. They would indeed be considered playful learning landscapes if we had any data on what learning actually occurred. But knowing what you're doing here, we could have had a whole other way of investigating. What were the interactions? Did this offer opportunities otherwise impossible elsewhere? We were also transforming underutilized space. Now, let's see if I can make this video go. The boy who swings from rope to horse, leaping back again to the swinging rope, is learning by his eyes, muscles, joints, and by every sense organ he has to judge, to estimate, to know. The other 29 boys and girls in the gym are all as active as he, some of them in his immediate vicinity. But as he swings, he does not avoid. He swings where there is space, a very important distinction. And in doing so, he threads his way among his 29 fellows. Using all his facilities, he is aware of the total situation in that gym, of his own swinging, and of his fellows' actions. If the room were cleared and 29 boys and girls sat at the side silent while he swung, we should in effect be saying to him, to his legs, body, eyes, be as egotistical as you like. If the swinging boy actually wonders about his choice of where to swing, of where there is space, he will invariably miss it. Neither the contact improvisation dancer nor the swinging boy can afford to be wrong. So these are, um, everything um, we were doing here at some level was precarious. You might call it risky recreation, ultimately transformed into guided player performance through rehearsal and learning about each other's bodies. I love your language. Adults initiated, child directed, community initiated, not much different than a choreogra choreographer constructor, and the inv invitation to dancers to play and communicate. In the next projects that I will describe, Beating a Path and Spill Out, we constructed or evolved space. The transgression of the cutting through the floor. Um, no theater will let you cut their floor. I've asked several times. They don't let you. I've got a chainsaw. Can I cut your floor? <laughs> so the fact that you did that and got that all together, and the fact that every time you went down, it would probably be different and there'd probably be an infinite number of ways, not quite, but almost, that you could get from up to down or from down to up. And directionally, it was interesting. Do you feel like it confuses where you are in space, like as a non-mover watching the movers? Do you feel like you all of a sudden get transformed in terms of your where, the where of you? I think in this piece right here, the inner two piece, I almost fell down when I was downstairs. I was watching the thing and moving around, and then at one point, 
somebody bumped into me, and I thought I had actually grabbed onto them for support. <laughs> I was transferring what I was doing onto what I was seeing, another dancer. Right, cool. So evolved space, I call space in the making, generated by the movements of action artists. These projects ask, act as pilots for long-standing space for ordinary inhabitation. So in the proposals, dancers and architects offer an alternative to ready-made space. Space in the making borrows from Bruno Latour's concept of ready-made science versus science in the making. Latour asks whether the profile of an experiment and its outcome will change based on its context. In our situation, context, in this case the very players or inhabitants, has an opportunity to change the space. So space in the making sets up a model for designing where we don't have a predetermined set of anything, drawings, a way of assembling things, or the way that people have to occupy it. This is a ready-made space that you're in. You walked in, you knew exactly what to do, you sat down. There isn't a lot of play in here. Um, that means that any physical construction that you would make would not be based on a preconceived generic idea about the context, the project, the occupants. Space in the making allows designers to work intimately with the situation at hand, and the design emerges from that specific full-scale and particular situation. It includes the physical and cultural context, the interactions with the users. Interestingly enough, um, I didn't know when to open, say this, but I, I looked at my drawing, and I, this is bizarre, okay, because it just didn't even enter my mind. But I did double Dutch skipping. Um, and I think about it now with the, re you'll see when, with my work, and what does double dutch sticking, stip, skipping do? It's so many things. It's finding the place where the space exists. You don't even, you have to anticipate the space. It's not there yet. Those of you who play football know you're always going to the open space. Um, and it, of course it has fundamental math in it, science. Distance equals rate times time, right? When do I jump? When is the opening? Um, not to mention the sinusoidal, sinusoidal curves that are there. We can go on and on. But most importantly for me, it was about the complex human interactions. When do you jump? Who's ma managing this? Who's talking? It's a lot of paying attention to the particular context. So this is what working with a community would do to actually design the creative landscapes, but would be redefined by the very movement of the people who may not be as predictable. Maybe a new group shows up from different kinds of relationships to different kinds of bodies and proclivities. Both Beating a Path and Spill Out demonstrate the extreme possibility of designing in movement and creating through the making where the space of construction and inhabitation can't be fully determined without that movement, without face-to-face -face interaction. They set up ambiguous liminal conditions. So three conditions have to be met. One, the design and construction is based on who and what is there. Two, the space must emerge concurrently from that specific context, the way the dancers move, the container in which the elements are placed, while both the space and the dance iterative, iteratively unfold. And three, even in the final performance, which ultimately is crafted for an audience to look at, possibilities of how each audience member can view or understand the whole can be different. Of course, of course the work that you see here is truly space in the making, a part of embodied learning where children are learning with their whole bodies. Our projects began with placing found objects in a space of rehearsal, and it didn't matter what we started with. So here we're used materials we literally found in the street, in the alley, to begin play in an abandoned storefront. A sewer, a sewer pipe and a piece of plywood transformed into a wheeled glass floor. How do we design space like a path? that emerges over time like the trampling of bushes by human occupation. So you know that when you crash through bushes, if you all crash through them, we'd actually have a path, we'd beat a path. But if we stopped doing it, that path would go away and would close up. So this is always about how does this thing evolve over time? So in, in our case, we looked at multiple kinds of materials. The vertical surface of the spandex registered the body and movement. 
Without the pressure of the dancer, the material reverted back to its taut first condition. And when one dancer pushed in, the other would be pushed back. Um, later on, we'll talk about a trampoline kind of punch the jump condition, which is a term for a wrongly timed landing that propels two bodies into unexpected trajectories. Um, this concept will emerge ma many times. The rolling platforms operated in the most extreme way. When the dancers moved the platforms, they pushed into the standing audience, and the spectators had to be conscious of where the platforms were and when. The onus was on the audience to move out of the way, otherwise they were going to get hit. The audience was a part of the performance. Space was made by the audience moving. When the dancers ran in one direction on the rolling glass floors, they are part of Newton's third law of physics. To every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Hence, the performers move in one direction on a rolling platform, the floors move in the opposite direction. That means an audience intently watching the performers run away, uh, which, that, and the dancers are running away from them, might miss that the floor, which is a glass edge, is on a collision course with their shins. So these projects clearly had us looking at how each can contribute to the making of space, a context, and a community. This was a continuum. There was no disjunction between how the bodies interact. How can we perform and thrive in constantly shifting ecosystems? How do we build trust, a shared language? How do we teach capacity for adaptive work? Sarah Hedren asks us to be a public, she asks us, be a public amateur. Consent to learn in public outside of one's discipline. By the way, that is owning imposter syndrome. I just want to say, we, we never get, it never goes away. But if we say that we're working in domains that are not our own, then we are asking the same questions we ask our children to ask every day. In Spill Out, so this is a great line by Herbert Simon, if you don't know it, Everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing conditions into preferred ones. In Spill Out, we built a structure where the bodies were dependent upon each other to not be thrust out. It, in this case, was a vertical trampoline. Each dancer had to be aware of the force and movement of each other dancer. Each performer had to be aware of the elasticity of the 10,000 bands that wrap the structure. These spandex bands only had so much elastic capacity, and the elastic wall may have been too taut or too loose with strands too far or too close. The dancer's engagement with the elements in full scale in real time showed the designers how dancers had to always relate to each other and to the structure. In every iteration, the physical frameworks, cha frameworks changed as, as, as the dancers became more familiar with the elements and as the elements became more tuned to the bodies of both the performance, performers and the body of each emerging phase. The goal was to have an installation that was both architecturally rigorous and stunning while allowing the dancers to have a myriad of ways to perform so that it always evolved, so they could be viewed, inspired, and supported by the installation and this goes back to the choreographer, architect initiated, dancer directed. The dancers know their own bodies. They worked using their skills and the learning curve of the structure. And finally, the, the configuration was a 40 foot long, 12 foot high, two and a half foot wide steel scaffold like structure covered with thousands of spandex strips in a 19th century red brick gas holder building, 100 feet in diameter and 50 feet high. So it evolved, we started with a little structure covered in rubber bands, a surface doomed to snap and catch on skin and hair and deteriorate, deteriorate over time in light, all conditions that could have been the foundation of a very powerful performance, but less likely to survive the normative demands of rehearsal overuse. So the final evolution revealed a numbers, number of ways to see, use, and experience the performance. It could be seen as a solid when lit from outside in the earlier slides, and the dancers were rendered invisible, or it could be pulled apart, stretched for the dancers to emerge or retreat. 
Over a long period of time, the spandex became plastic, losing some of its elasticity, and the dance itself had to shift, accommodating the material changes. And the dancers, of course, always have to be aware of how their bodies are interacting with materials to take advantage of the fluctuations, both subtle and dramatic. And when sealed inside, the light thrown from one end of the wall could create a complete and distinct set of performances from cast shadows on the cylindrical interior surface of the gas holder house. Ultimately, the viewer could see the work multiple times and have a completely different experience each time. In fact, the dancers had a continuously different experience as well. One viewing may be concentrated only on the shadows, another could engage sections of the spandex wall, another could see the entire scaffold, or there could be combinations of all of them. It's unlikely that anyone could get it all at once. This is indeed the point. As space in the making, as a space in the making as opposed to ready-made space. Nothing could be seen at once. Both the dancers and the audience had multiple modes of experiencing the performance. That means when you're installing anything, you wanna make sure people come back over and over because the experience changes for them every single time. Oops, hmm, okay, let's see if I can make this one go. Wow, okay, so you're gonna have to go with me on this. <laughs> These dancers are actually projecting their bodies against the spandex, and they could propel each other out if they're not paying attention to both the elastic and where the other person is located. So they're actually dancing in sync, so that it's really critical to be aware of the community on the, the, um, on the wall. In this case, as I mentioned, the elastic becomes plastic and yielding and then brittle and actually could break. You know, like an elastic pair of old running shorts. The performance changed daily. With less aggressive gestures, the bands yielded more readily. You had to know what your partner was doing. It was a felt knowing. How hard could you go by sensing the tension in the performance? We took this another step. In every city I worked, I found the best local dance company. In Eugene, it was Danceability, a mixed abilities dance company. At the same time, as I was, I had two jobs. I was the dean of the school, but I was also doing this program. Um, my day job, I was launching an adaptive athlete section of our product design program. And the two programs looked at human ability and variability very differently. One, like many prosthetic biomedical engineering programs, see the variability as an opportunity for a fix for therapy, for a cure. Danceability sees variability as a celebration of difference. This contested te territory is the place we wanna be. There is a tension between Sarah Hedren's practical, functional, use-based, efficient model versus the performative, the poetic, the uncertain. So in Wounded Warriors product design course, we took aspiring Paralympians and built prosthetics for them fixing the body, in fact, making them superhuman. In the dance, don't leave me, we went back to the model of ultimately we're all connected and depends on who shows up, an opportunity that Susan Segal of Mobility International calls an infiltration of difference. In order to do the project in movement, it meant building at full scale and in real time. Hence, we work with whoever shows up for rehearsal, pushing that the dancers had to be there for every built experiment. The space of the project emerged from the specific context, 
the very people rehearsing, and the particular objects or space we were playing with. While the spaces and the dance iteratively unfolded, we officially met twice a week for our class in an abandoned warehouse. We were up, you know, there's a lot of abandoned warehouses in every town you can imagine. The dancers didn't have rehearsals um, in between because it was very exhausting for them as dancers with disabilities. We had to really program when they could be performing. Uh, but the architects met regularly because building actually takes much more time than moving your body. Well, let's see if this rule. Uh, I, somehow this is not videotaping going. Here, I think. Thanks. Right. So, without a leg and missing a pelvis, Karen could fold up into a very small shape. The cubes that ultimately got designed got smaller and smaller. The height became a walker level for Karen, the interior a small house. We anticipated applying our discoveries to the other occupants, not fully understanding that most adults can't fold their bodies the way Karen could. Our tests were movement driven. The cubes and how they were used were repeatedly reordered and their size and use redefined each time the dancers encountered them. In one seminal experiment, a few dancers stacked a set of cubes and then climbed into them. It became clear that top-loading the cubes would cause them to fall over. One dancer close to the top felt the cubes wobble and cried out, don't leave me. That became the basis for the section. The structure was only stable if the dancers held it together with their hands and by locating their bodies to shift the weight. This is real technology, by the way, of understanding forces through a structure. We seized the invention. We spent the next weeks determining how high we could go and how thin the frames could be. By using their bodies as part of the architecture, the dancers had to constantly be evaluating how to use their bodies to stabilize the project. This type of construction is time consuming. It relies on continuous observation of the dancers by the architects, by continuous evaluation of the dancers, of how their bodies are re reacting to the elements and, unra and on rapid build out and prototyping between rehearsals. I wonder if this is our data database. But more significantly, the body can adapt much more quickly to the physical context than the physical context can adapt to us. This means the dancers can change a movement in a moment and the constructors will have to set design and assembly times to accommodate that body shift. Time is critical, and it may make more sense that many times for the body to rethink the movement than the environment to change. The structure was only stable if the dancers held it together with their hands and by locating their bodies and shifting weight. How high could we go? The collective musculatures were totally part of the architecture. If you leave me, I will topple. As the shapes became more unstable and unpredictable, the dancers paid more attention. They became more in sync with the environment that seemed to continually be under construction. The dancers had to adjust to the forces in the wood and the space was transformed by this careful shift. These transient visceral environments are an immediate physical arena where mutual trust, understanding of each other, scale and community are omnipresent. If one element, one hand grip fails, another hand muscle must compensate or the community is in danger. The overall dissolves. Beating a path and don't leave me represent connections and the mapping of our physical and architectural bodies together. If we can't feel the force that we exert on each other, sometimes but just leaning on your next door neighbor or through the vehicle of an unstable structure, then there's failure. Success depends on both the individual and the community in respected relationships. <laughs> Rely on the team. Thank you. And now, 
I'd like to call Ralph Smith from the campaign for grade level reading to the stage for closing remarks. Thank you. Good morning. I was fully prepared to own the imposter uh, title. Absolutely fully prepared to embrace it. And then I realized that actually I should embrace being a public amateur. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the legend of, legend of favors that brings me here has a whole lot to do with how much I owe Kathy. And she can collect for the next 10 years, and I would still be ahead. But what Kathy didn't tell me is that in the audience today would be the greatest provocateur I know, and that's Barry Zuckerman. <laughs> she, she didn't tell me that because it is truly intimidated to be any place. I'm having to look out and look at Barry Zuckerman. And if those of you who don't know, actually, Barry, I see you were elevated because you were called a gentleman earlier. And I've never heard that, but I, I, I assume that you appreciated it. Um, my task is, first of all, to ask everybody to find this card. And trust me, I, I don't have a game for you, so don't. Um, the organizers of today's event have a serious interest in continuing the conversation. Uh, this is not intended as a one-off, and they are inviting and encouraging everyone here to take seriously their invitation to share the question you would have asked had we more time, uh, the comment you would have made, the issue that you believe that we left uncovered or underattended, and any critique or suggestions you may have about further work. This is a really, this is a really serious uh, invitation, so uh, make good use of this card. And as you do so, um, I'm hoping that some of you uh, will take seriously this aspiration to build a global movement. And because of that aspiration, look more critically at this commitment to find the evidence um, and to codify the elements. Because in those two, there is the possibility that the potential dis for disruption could easily be lost. And so whatever I hear, find the evidence and codify the elements, that tells me to be especially cautious, especially attentive and, vigil and vigilant because those two run the potential of recreating uh, what we have and losing the disruptive creativity that is the promise of this incipient and emerging uh, move, move, movement. You know, there's a sort of a transformative potential in this notion that we ought to acknowledge that children are hardwired for learning. And so every time somebody says we, we need to get children ready to learn, you know, that's a sort of an oxymoron that really is amusing if people didn't take it so seriously. Uh, children are hardwired for learning. The question is, are we prepared to enable, encourage, and expand the opportunity for learning. That's the, cha that's the challenge that this movement is taking on. 
And it's taken it on by looking at the larger environment, by looking at the built environment, by hearkening back to the wonderful literature about third places, and recreating uh, this notion that there are places and spaces where community happens. And in those places and spaces, we have this opportunity to promote a vastly enriched and expanded notion uh, of learning. And I know we're um, five minutes and 24 seconds past our promised uh, time. And some of you may know I'm a lawyer and are sitting down there saying, lawyers speak in 40 minutes sound bites, so we've got another half hour to go. <laughs> let, me, let me cut to this. You know, there really is something uh, quite special here, this notion that you can close the gap between the science and the practice, this notion that place and learning are not independent. In fact, they're codependent, and we need to acknowledge that. But coming from the standpoint of the campaign for grade level reading, and I really appreciate the shout out, Elliot, uh, there's one particular aspect of this that I'd like to lift up. You know, there are many of us who like children a whole lot more than we like adults. I'm among them, right? <laughs> and when we commit learning to schools, we essentially commit learning to people who have chosen to spend their time with children and not adults. We have committed learning to a professional institution that is all about kids and that is populated by people who share what a lot of us have, a deep suspicion of parents, especially low-income parents. And there are many of us, if we really admit it, believe that many of these parents are where they are because they've made bad choices and bad judgments on their own lives and are not fully to be trusted to make good decisions for their children. And we build institutions to essentially mitigate the possibility that they'll mess up their kids because we can take care of them for 20% of the time. By expanding the learning zone and the learning opportunity, we create the possibility that even as we seek to transform schools and make them more welcoming to parents and families, that we can have in communities places and spaces where parents don't have to knock down the doors. In fact, they may not even have to knock on the doors. Where parents can go with their kids and can feel some sense of agency and can feel a sense of efficacy in dealing with their kids. Uh, spaces and places where we can practice what we're now coming to understand as relational health, and we can, it's a kind of an opportunity for an authentic practice. And places and spaces which, if we do it right, can shorten the century plus that Rebecca uh, scared the hell out of us by saying it would take to close the gap between the poor. We ought to be intentional about saying part of the reason why we're doing this is to increase the likelihood that as these children learn more, more about themselves and more about the world as they're embraced by stronger communities that these children may, may have improved prospects of gra grasping that first rung on the ladder of the success sequence 
And here at Brookings, we ought to have the success sequence in mind. And we ought to be able to say loudly that if we do this right, these children should stand a better chance of graduating from high school. And they should stand a better chance of graduating from high school because they'll have a better chance of experiencing early school success. And they'll have a better chance of early school success because they'll have more interactive and joyful childhoods in the company and in the care of their parents and of the communities in which they live. That's the potential of this work, and it seems to me it's a wonderful cause. It's a great opportunity, and I just want to congratulate all the folks we heard here today and the folks who are involved in supporting this movement. This is great work. Uh, I'm pleased to be in any way associated with it. I thank Kathy and Roberta uh, for allowing me to tag, tag along, and I wish you well. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.